Okay, so uh, today we're going to start a whole different topic in a way. So we spent a lot of time studying uh, correlations in insulators uh, in various spin liquids, um, and also talked a bit recently about fractional quantum Hall states, which are also similar to insulators in many ways. Um, and you know, I surveyed a lot of the developments that happened in the last 20, 30 years in the field, and a lot has been learned, uh, and the field is uh, uh, it, you know, quite mature now. Of course, there are things that, a few small questions here and there that need to be sorted out, but on the whole, the theory is in pretty good shape. However, you know, original motivation for studying strongly interacting system came from the cuprate superconductor, for example, uh, where really all the interesting phenomena ultimately are in metals, not in insulators. Um, and so we want to think about now the effect of strong interactions uh, in metals. Now we said a little bit about it at the very beginning of the course when I talked about Fermi liquid theory. Uh, and the conclusion was that strong interactions don't do very much. Uh, that all they do is uh, renormalize the mass of your quasi particles and maybe give you some Landau interaction parameters that uh, take strange values. Uh, but other than that, it's still a free Fermi gas. Uh, and you know, this is sometimes we call the tyranny of the Fermi liquid. I mean, the Fermi liquid is a rather stable object uh, and it's found you know, all over the place in the real world. Um, but so the remainder of the course is really a way to now, to start thinking about strong correlations in, in metals. And the simplest context is to take something we know well with strong correlations, which is spin system. And let's take a single spin uh, and couple it to a metal. And that's what the convent purity model is. Uh, this was actually understood even longer ago in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and maybe, even, yeah. Uh, but I will present it from perhaps a more modern perspective. And that will also allow us to talk about more complicated systems where you have strong interactions. Uh, in metals, uh, condo lattice models and Hubbard models, where now we know you can get interesting strong correlated phases, uh, even with metals, uh, including some uh, metals that don't even have quasi particles. So that, that's sort of where the course is going to go. And I'll kind of end with that uh, discussion of various models of metals uh, without quasi particles. Okay, so, so that's sort of where we are. So, so we'll talk about the very simplest case where we take the simplest system with strong correlation, which is a single spin, and couple it to a Fermi liquid. And that's what the quantum purity model is. So quantum, uh, you know, it was actually discovered experimentally, the model that we're going to discuss, uh, through some experimental observations by actually Miriam Sarachek, who just died a few weeks ago. Um, so perhaps it should be called the Sarachi Kanu model, but I think it's too late for that. Kondo solved it theoretically, at least understood the, the most important theoretical property of it. Um, so you take a, a metal like copper. So you have some big metal and, and this metal has electrons from the liquid light and you put in a single impurity, a single site, I say something like manganese, uh, where there's a spin, okay. Uh, so this spin will couple to the environment with some exchange coupling um, of, uh, uh, let's say there's some coupling, we'll call it uh, uh, J sub K. Okay, I'll make this all more precise and specific model shortly. But qualitatively, uh, what would you expect? So if you have a single spin, uh, the Hamiltonian uh, is, well, just zero. It's got two, you know, with a spin a half, there's two degenerate levels. Uh, but if you put in a small magnetic field, a Zeeman field, let's call that H, it will couple to the spin this way. And what you measure is called the susceptibility. You look at the response of the system to this magnetic field, uniform magnetic field to a single spin. Um, and that's a QD susceptibility. Uh, and the answer you get, uh, again, an undergraduate calculation that they urge you to redo if you haven't done it before. Uh, is S 
address this one over three T. Um, and for uh, for a spin and a half, uh, this is one over four. So that's the curious susceptibility. It diverges as temperature goes to zero. On the other hand, the metal, the rest of the metal here, uh, will have a susceptibility which is called the Pauli susceptibility. This will, of course, be proportional to the volume of the system, a single impurity. Uh, Chi Pauli is proportional to the volume. Um, and uh, as t goes to zero, it, and you get a factor of the density of states at the Fermi level. So this, uh, as t goes to zero, uh, goes to a constant. So the Pauli susceptibility is one of the signatures of a Fermi surface uh, because you have a finite density of states at the Fermi level. Um, you know, you have this picture. This is your dispersion. These are your upspin electrons and downspin electrons as a function of k. Uh, and when you put a magnetic field on, you change the Fermi level for the two of them. Uh, and it's this the magnetization is the difference here, which is proportional to the density of states. And the, uh, and the, uh, the magnetic field basically, which gives you the splitting of the two levels. And that's how you get a constant disk, constant susceptibility. So, one thing you notice here is that the effect of impurities becomes very large as t goes to zero, whereas the effect of the metal is uh, relatively small. And so, even a small density of impurities is easy to observe. You just put a very low temperatures, and you'll see the Curie contribution. So uh, there, this is the, the Pauli term is neglecting the um, or coupling to the orbital motion of the electrons. Or uh, yeah, so there's a diamagnetic contribution which has the opposite sign, which typically comes from uh, from far from the Fermi level. Uh, yeah, I see. So that is also a constant actually in a Fermi liquid. Uh, yeah. Okay. So sometimes you have to worry about it mostly. Uh, uh, it's not as important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I assume that this the Pauli expression is at large v. At large what? At large v. At large volume. Sure. Sure. Infinite volume. We are right. going to talk about infinite volume. So, but it might have order one correction on a finite size effect. How does uh, that? How does that uh, interact with the Curie kind, which is also order one? Uh, yeah, so that's a second question. I don't think, you know, then you'd have to really go into the condom model and study it. it's fine that's that behavior. But aren't you really interested in having a non-zero density of impurities? They're far apart, so you can treat them individually. That's right. Well, eventually we're going to bring them closer together, not uh, just like two wheel. Yeah. For today, you're, but when you discuss observing it, when Miriam Sarachek observed it, she yeah. had a lot of impurities. Yeah, so there was a finite density, but still very small, a percent. 1% or even smaller, you can yeah, see that. So that might be enough to control the finite size because they both scale in you know, the volume. You, you have a huge sample. Sample is infinite. Uh, let's just work in that limit for today's lecture. So V is infinite, uh, but there is a finite density of impurity. So maybe I should multiply this by uh, the volume times the density. So both, both, both contributions scale and volume. But there is a small number here. Okay, that's pretty what I should have said. So there's some density of these impurities, and there's a factor volume here too. And now we're just looking at the results per volume, P is infinite. Uh, and then uh, even though rho imp is very small, you want rho imp to be small, so you don't have to worry about the coupling between impurities. So let's imagine rho imp is 1% or even smaller. Uh, then you just need your temperature to be 1% of the Fermi energy. So this is roughly. You know, V over the Fermi energy. Um, okay, I mean, I have to, yeah, or maybe there's a number of particles over the Fermi energy in the appropriate units. Okay, um, so you want the temperature to be 1% of the Fermi energy, which is very easy. Fermi energy is 100,000 Kelvin, 10,000 Kelvin. So if you go down to well, modest temperatures, you can be completely dominated by the star. Okay. All right, so this is what you would expect when they're really far apart. Uh, and naively, so now the question really is, does this really work? If, so now we just have one impurity in an infinite sample. Uh, and the question is, does it still have a divergent susceptibility uh, as temperature goes to zero? 
So this was not the first observation, but uh, I'm not talking about history here. So what actually does happen, uh, if you look at the impurity susceptibility. So the way you define this, if you're high impurity is you measure the full susceptibility, uh, you subtract the poly term, uh, and you just divide by the number of impurities. The poly term is proportional to the volume. Uh, well, this is also proportional to the volume if the number of impurities scales with the volume. So you subtract out the poly term, which you know somehow, uh, and then you look at impurity susceptibility. And you assume the impurities are far enough apart that you don't have to worry about that interaction. So then as a function of temperature, you would expect the Curie term uh, just from this hand at all. Um, and you do see it. Uh, now at low temperatures, different things can happen. If the impurities see each other, uh, you could get some magnetic order. You get a freezing, a spin glass. In fact, this is how spin glasses were discovered too, uh, when the impurities become more dense. Uh, but here, let's imagine they're really dilute. Uh, and then what you find, in fact, it doesn't diverge and saturates at some temperature. Uh, and so this temperature is called the condo temperature. And this chi imp. Uh, well, let's say it's this, and you can view this as a definition of the condo temperature. So there's a low temperature scale, uh, which is actually exponentially small in J, as you'll see. Um, and uh, so at that point, the spin ceases to be free, uh, and it's called condo screen. It becomes effectively it becomes an electron, as you'll see. Uh, so the, I say that because the susceptibility is finite, and, and we view you know, the Pauli susceptibility as like the signature of a, a Fermi system in the finite density states. Uh, so it sort of becomes Pauli-like because the spin becomes part of the Fermi C. Okay. This also has the flavor, as we'll see, of confinement transitions. Uh, and this condo temperature is the analog of QCD, of lambda QCD, uh, when you're going from uh, here free spin like behavior to, uh, to some kind of confined state, which in our case will be the Fermi liquid. Okay. Um, and so there's some arbitrariness in definition of TK, just like lambda QCD. Uh, different people define it differently, uh, but let's, let's define it this way. Okay. All right, so, and in fact, if you want to look at this behavior here at low temperatures, uh, there's a function here, which will be temperature over TK. Okay, and what we know today is that this is a universal function. It only depends on, doesn't depend on anything, uh, other than the fact that the spin has impurity. If it's spin one, it'll be different, and so on. Um, and so, this, so, so the aim of the theory right now is to compute this function. Today, of course, we can compute these things essentially exactly, uh, but it took a while to understand how to do such things. Okay, so this function as t goes to zero, goes to a constant, it goes to one. So whatever this function is, we define it as x uh, is to one. And then, and also as phi of x goes to infinity, it has to match the one over four t, so it must go as one over x. Okay. So there's some function that goes between one and one over x, which looks like this, uh, and you have to compute it. <laughs> That's the goal of theory. And uh, today, you know, to the work of not on Andre and others, we have exact on this equation, which implicates such things. All right. Uh, so that's one property of a condo model. The original property that was measured uh, was the resistance minimum. And that also looks kind of similar. So you measure the resistivity of the sample as a function of temperature. And this is a bit more complicated because many other things contribute to resistivity not just the spins. Uh, there's electrons interacting with phonons, or whatever it is, there's some resistivity in the pure metal without magnetic impurities, uh, which normally would go in like this. So this is without, uh, without uh, 
impurity, uh, magnetic impurities, no spins. So, so you measure this. I think maybe Miriam did something like this. You measure rho of t, and then you put in a few impurities, uh, and then you see what happens. And what you find then uh, is that the resistance changes. Uh, you know, it comes down, looks the same up here, but then there's some minimum, and eventually it saturates. So this part here is very similar to, you know, to that part. It's not the same function. Uh, it's a different function. So there's some excess resistivity. So let's say delta rho. Uh, again, it'll be some function uh, of T over T condo, uh, which goes to a constant as uh, over here. Uh, and then has been decreased. So the effect of the impurity becomes much stronger at low temperature. So it's kind of the opposite here. Here the impurity dominates at high temperatures or the impurity susceptibility uh, because this, that's, you know, the impurity has a huge effect on the susceptibility. But if the impurity was just sitting there and decoupled from the system, it has no effect on the resistance. But at low temperature, effectively the impurity becomes strongly coupled uh, to the electrons and that increases the resistivity of the, of the metals. So what's uh, observed then is the minimum, this is called the condo minimum. Really this should be called the Saracic minimum. <laughs> uh, where, and this happens again roughly at the condo temperature. Well, they're not exactly because after all, where the minimum is depends on the background. <laughs> okay. But that's of order PK. It's not exactly equal. Yeah, it's not the same. I mean, it will depend on what the background is. So and the function is not the same, right? It's a different so function. It's a different function. It's, yes. different function. it's a different property of the same universal fixed point theory that can be, you know, it's, this is related to some kind of T matrix uh, of the quantum impurity. The other is just the thermodynamics. Okay, so that's the, the background. Um, and so the model we want to study uh, is the following. So let's write, let's write down the final purity model. Um, so, so I'm gonna take the, the, the bulk, the copper atoms say, uh, put them on a lattice. Uh, I'll only draw one dimension of the lattice but this is meant to be a two or three dimensional lattice. We're looking at it edge on. And then there's one impurity here, um, which uh, I call the D electron. So these would be the C electrons. They have a spin alpha. And then I have a D electron sitting here. Uh, there's Hubble matrix elements T here. Uh, and we we'll call this sometimes called the hybridization. Uh, this is not actually, this is not the condo model, excuse me. This is called, well, <laughs> uh, the Anderson model, but there's so many Anderson models, well, that's confusing, but it's really the Anderson model. <laughs> it, I will derive the condom model from the Anderson model in a little while. Um, so the Hamiltonian is uh, minus P, its neighbors, C there, I alpha, C J alpha. And then you have this site, epsilon D, uh, and energy D dagger alpha, D alpha. There's a chemical potential, which is you know, as usual, I won't write it out. Uh, then there's a hybridization, which couples the C and the D, the local impurity, which will be something like minus W times D dagger alpha, C zero alpha, this will be, the spin at this side, this is the side zero. Uh, plus I mentioned conjugate. And finally, to make this a spin uh, rather than another electron, electronic state, we have to put in the local interaction. So there's U times uh, ND up, ND down. Uh, so where ND also is C dagger. D dagger alpha D 
Okay, so that's so that's the Anderson model, right? Anderson impurity model. There's another Anderson model, right? <laughs> yeah. This is meant to be in one dimension. Or... No, no. Uh, you could do it in one day, but the behavior in one day is a bit more complicated. So two, let's say two and above. All right, so this is our, uh, so this is a two dimensional lattice and just one side. So if you look at it from the top, you have a lattice here. Uh, and there's an, uh, an impurity side there. There's an extra orbital on that side, uh, which is the manganese orbital, the D orbital. Uh, so now we are interested in the limit where U is much, much bigger than anything else, P and W. The impurity, so the underlying, the ambient space would be any number of dimensions, so one, two, three. But Let's say two and above, two and above. And the impurity is always a point. It cannot be on a line. That's right. It's a point. It's always a point, like, like in this picture. Uh, or in space-time, it's a line. Okay. Right. So it's a line impurity in space-time. And there is a, it's not a trivial impurity, it's got a, it's got a dynamic degree of freedom on it, uh, which is because of you have to add the, it's the degree of freedom that gives you the curious susceptibility at high temperatures. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right, so, so that's the model we'd love to solve. In this you do not allow it to hop. So it's, is it pinned down? No, no, it is hopping, that's the W. I don't see it hop. D. So the impurity can also move around. Or, uh, uh, okay, or so the, 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 I thought alpha is the spin index of the impurity. Right, so, so let's see, there's two different things. There's a manganese uh, nucleus. Yes. The manganese nucleus sitting here does not hop. Okay, okay. It does not move. But, so that the, the presence of manganese nucleus just means there's an extra state here, there's an extra D state, which is this state. And the electrons can, can hop in and out of that state, for sure. <laughs> Okay. Now, what makes it spin is the fact that U is much bigger than T and W. And this is very similar to the Hubbard model. If you go back, uh, historically, of course, things came in the opposite order. Uh, but we talked about the Hubbard model uh, and then showed that at half filling, uh, it just became a spin because at large U, you put one electron there, but you were forbidden from putting the second electron. And that's what exactly what will happen here. We are adjusting epsilon d uh, so that uh, this d orbital likes to have one electron. So uh, let's see. So if I just take the d site, Now maybe I should do this part before what I was going to do. So if I just take the D site, uh, uh, just the D part, there's only two terms in the Hamiltonian, let's call it HD. Uh, and the chemical potential, let's say, has been absorbed in, uh, in the definition of ED. Okay, so there are four possible states on that impurity site. Uh, there's the empty state, which will have energy <laughs> uh, and there's a doubly occupied state, which will have energy. Uh, so that's the empty state. There's a doubly occupied site. You have energy two epsilon d plus u, uh, and there's a single occupied site that uh, will be here. We we'll call that epsilon d. Uh, that's one or this. So we naturally we want epsilon d to be. I oh, hope I got this right. You sorry, sorry. Yeah, no. right. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, zero and two epsilon d plus u. And here's the single occupied site. This or this, which will have energy epsilon d. Uh, and we are assuming that this is much below that. Uh, so a typical value would be epsilon d is of order minus u over two. That's the particle whole symmetric case. And these two become degenerate. That doesn't matter, they're way up there. Uh, and uh, you've got a, a, a spin sitting here. 
So, you know, as we discovered in the last month or so, once you have a spin with this constraint of single occupancy, all kinds of novel things can happen, fractionalizations, spin liquids, anions, and so on. And we are hoping for such similar fractalized phenomena here, although this particular model, they don't happen. Um, but there's still an interesting regime, a crossover regime where it's as if things are fractionalized, uh, which is again, not dissimilar from QCD. <laughs> so there, is yeah. there any reason to think of this D this D particle as actually one of the electrons from the manganese atom? Yeah, absolutely, that's what it is. That's, that's the picture. Yes, yeah, so. I mean, the picture is that, uh, you know, the matrix uh, has uh, some sort of uh, on the conduction bands, which are S and T and D orbitals, but you know, manganese has an extra, has those plus an extra electron. So, which is why it is added as a certain site. I mean, there's a very precise way of doing the band structure and deriving actually all the numbers. Model. I mean, really, all you need to know is the spin of the impurity. That's a well defined number. Uh, so, if the spin is a half uh, at low energies, there's nothing, this is all there is to it. There's only one number you need to know the W. Okay. The orbital spin of the electron of the manganese atom matter. So, for example, it would have. Uh, it could matter. So, if you had degenerate levels, uh, then, of course, you will also, the spin could be different from spin a half, but it was Boone's rule, you would get uh, some maximal spin. But you could also have orbital fluctuation, then you get multi channel condo problems. Yeah, so that would be more, that would be another index on D other than the spin. So that's a natural way to get the multi channel. Uh, <laughs> or just I mean, that was the original motivation. I think experimentally, uh, because the orbitals are not exactly degenerate. Uh, there is, an, and that breaks all the multi channel exotic multi channel effects. Uh, I think there have been other realization of the condo problem in semiconductor heterostructures uh, where the condo degree of freedom is not spin, but the spin is that you have like you hit like the orbital index, so you're guaranteed to have a degeneracy. So there's been actually some very beautiful experiments by uh, Dan Ralph and David Goldhopper Gordon, I think. Um, where they have seen multi-channel condo effects using uh, gates. So basically a, a quantum dot also is like a quantum condo problem. That's a different, that's a more recent realization of this, yeah. But in, uh, yeah, well, there have been some, but not entirely convincing claims that in higher spin or higher orbital impurities in metals uh, that there's multi-channel condo physics. Okay, but that's getting sidetracked. All right, so you've got a spin. Um, and so in the large U limit, we can do what's called, in this context, it's called the Schieffer Wolf transformation. Uh, but that's exactly the transformation we, we made uh, to get the, the Heisenberg exchange model from the Hubbard model. Huh? And we're, as we're doing this in the opposite historical order, all of this was done before all of the work on the, on the, uh, on the Hubbard model. So it's not as obvious as it seems now. So what we're gonna do is we have this impurity here, uh, and these are this, this impurity is coupled to some uh, conduction band, with some whole bunch of energy levels here. Uh, and now what can happen uh, is that this electron, for example, can go from here to there. So when it goes there, this level will move up here because it's uh, empty. <laughs> uh, and then uh, what, what happens? Yeah, so it's become empty uh, and then it can come back as a spin down while flipping the spin of the conduction electron. So basically this, you can flip the spin of this electron while flipping the spin of the conduction electron, okay? So that's our second order process. You want me to draw it more explicitly? Uh, so this electron, so there's two possible states. The spin down, the spin down goes up here. So you have an extra spin down sitting there. And then you take an electron to spin up here and you bring it down here. So you're left with a spin up electron there, 
spin down electron there, you have a spin up electron here. So the impurity spin is flipped, and also the conduction electron spin is flipped. So that gives you a, an exchange coupling, very much like in the Hubbard model, almost exactly the same thing happens. The difference was in the Hubbard model, you got two sites with exactly the same level structure. Here you have an impurity spin with some Fermi C. Or really, as you can see from here, it's the site zero. So, so now I'm, I can write down the condo model, which is closely connected to this. Uh, the bulk system is exactly the same. Um, and, and that whole mess under these conditions where this level is much below these two uh, will give you the condo hemochromia. And I'm sorry, so to be consistent with all my notation of the notes uh, and various other things we'll do later, I'm gonna call this use of D. <laughs> So what you will get is the condo interaction. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is this just take? J condo uh, and to second order is the impurity spin, which I'll call SD now. SD darted into C dagger zero alpha sigma alpha beta over two C zero beta. And here SD is just exactly one half D dagger alpha sigma beta beta. And J condo uh, is the following. It's two W squared and one over minus epsilon D plus one over epsilon D plus U. So these two terms come from, uh, from the reverse process. Here you have a spin down say, then it can happen in the opposite order. You can take an electron from here, pick a spin up electron, put it here, then you get a doubly occupied site. <coughs> and then one of these can go back. So you come back down here with a spin flip. Okay, so those are the two energy denominators. Um, and this is to second order in W. Now there's also another term, which is often neglected, which is something like V times C dagger, zero alpha, zero alpha times ND up, there's ND down, it's like a density density interaction. Uh, we just ignore it. It's there, but it doesn't do much. Uh, the important term is the condo exchange term. Okay, so this is our Hamiltonian that we'd like to study. Uh, and what condo did, uh, was perturbation theory in JK. We computed the resistance to second order in JK. To second order in JK, you just get uh, you just get temperature independent contribution. So you have to go to third order in JK. So it's sort of like a two loop graph. And when you evaluate it, you find you found a logarithm, logarithmic dependence on temperature, uh, and that was an indication that something is becoming larger. Okay. Uh, and this is again analogous to QCD, where if you compute the gauge coupling constant, you find normalization, which are logarithms. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll do some of that in a, short, in a few minutes. Yeah. So conceptually, if you start from H, what exactly did you do to get to HK? Did you integrate out anything or? Well, uh, you should view it as a canonical transformation. So we talked about this at the beginning of the course. Uh, you do a canonical transformation where you eliminate W. So you, you define a new Hamiltonian, so roughly speaking, HK is H times some U, U dagger. Okay. 
Okay, so that's what it is. Um, when you say you integrate out those two levels, that, uh, you could say that. I mean, but it's if you want to do it exactly and not generate time dependent turns, you have to do it this way. If you want to work, use the Hamiltonian picture, this is what you have to do. But, but you still have the D's, so you didn't integrate out the two levels. Well, uh, yes, but there's a constraint now. Uh, D dagger alpha, D alpha is one. So these are not really fermions anymore. They are constrained for Perhaps us. in this last term, you could set N D plus N D up and plus N D down equal to one, right? To be consistent. Uh, yes, yes. In fact, yeah. So there is, a, yeah, you're absolutely right. So it's, this is correct. So th there's a potential scattering term. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. And maybe that's what caused the confusion. I mean, if, if you do this by doing rule one Wigner perturbation theory to get the effective Hamiltonian in the degenerate subspace, that Hamiltonian is energy dependent. Okay. And this, Canonical transformation is equivalent to sort of getting rid of that energy dependence. Oh, uh, let me. It's, it's negligible in the large U limit, right? All right, let me just say that if, uh, since it was many months ago when we did this. <laughs> All right, so I can get it Maybe it was a homework problem. <laughs> uh, so, right now, you know, you're, you can view the, you have a big Hamiltonian, uh, which is whose Hilbert space has been split into four sectors. So there's really one, two, three, four. So you can divide the whole Hamiltonian into four sectors. Uh, and in this sector, you have spin up on the downside here, you have spin down on the D side, you have an empty side and you have, okay. So this is our Hamiltonian. And there's all, and you have all possible infinite number of states of the conventional electron in each block, but the state of the D spin is specified. Uh, and so this, however, this W sitting here, where is the W here, uh, had, has the off diagonal contributions here. There's various Ws here. All the W terms connect these sectors. If you take your out of singly occupied state to W. So you do a canonical transformation, you choose your U so that all of these Ws in the new Hamiltonian in the H condo, these are gone, two second order W. Uh, actually, these don't go away, but, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, these, these blocks go away. So now you have a reduced Hamiltonian in this block. We can forget about those terms. And that reduced Hamiltonian uh, is that one. And the Ws are here, sorry, they're not here. All the Ws are here. Okay, so there's no W, we've gotten rid of this at price. The price is uh, that you have a constraint, but you've gained a lot, uh, you've gained in the large U limit, you have a coupling constant J, which is small. Since U is going to infinity, JK is small. It's much smaller than any other scale. Uh, um, but it's, and so you might think, okay, all's well and good. I have a small coupling. I can just do perturbations here in it. Uh, and that's what Conrad discovered that you can't. Because, uh, and the reason you can't is because you have a gapless uh, set of states to also deal with. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, well, yeah, maybe I'll just the way the discussion is going, I'll, I'll do it in a different order than the notes, uh, might as well. So let me just go ahead, since I've prepared the ground, uh, to describe a little bit about Condo's calculation. Okay, so what Condo computed uh, in today's language would be interpreted uh, as uh, the RG flow of the condo coupling. Uh, in fact, that's what was interpreted by Yuval and Anderson. Uh, and this was really the early, very early days of RG before Wilson had even entered the game. Um, okay, so what condo computed was uh, the 
let's just say we have, we have field theories. We don't know about RG, but we know a little bit about field theory. Uh, is the renormalization uh, of JK? Uh, okay. So, so we have a you know we have this constraint on the D dagger D, uh, and this makes life difficult for us in the sense that we can't think of D as a free fermion or even the spin as a free fermion um, that obeys the Wix theorem. But it's not really much of a problem uh, because we can evaluate the perturbation theory, time order perturbation theory, uh, without using Wix theorem, just by actually explicitly look, looking at the time order correlation function, right? So you take your partition function, uh, which is the trace of e to the minus beta hk, uh, and then you can write it um, yes, the sum expansion of various time order correlation functions. Uh, of, you know, you have some C's, C, C dagger, you know, various S's, and so on at various times. Forms like this, just expand the whole thing out. Uh, and have some integrals over times. These will have various times and there'll be a time ordering symbol. Okay, uh, lots of indices here that I'm dropping. So the usual trick when you do Feynman diagrams, when you get a multi-point correlator like this, uh, is you use Wick's theorem. But here, uh, well, uh, you have you can't use Wick's theorem on the S's, but you can on the C's because you're, you're, this is an expansion where we think of HK as H zero plus some interaction, and how you are H zero. Is just free fermions. Oh. Okay. So this part we have a very simple Hamiltonian from which we can do time order for the gradient theory. For the spins, well, um, the Hamiltonian is zero. There is no spin, pure spin Hamiltonian. All of the Hamiltonian uh, is in the interaction field. So actually, let's see. It's to be for this to be consistent to have four C's and two S's. And so this is a term of order JK squared. So we're just doing perturbations here in JK. Uh, and so you get four C's and two S's. So what do we do with this? Well, since the free Hamiltonian, the spin uh, and the electrons decouple, uh, we can go ahead and apply Wick's theorem here. Okay, and then what about the spin? Well, the only thing the spins we need to know from this time ordered expansion, they come at certain times, say tau one, tau two, and they have some indices A and B. Um, so the only thing we need to know from this time ordering symbol is the ordering of the spins. You know, does A come before B or B come before A? So this thing, depending on where we have the integration, Will be either trace S A S B or trace S B S A. So if all you need to do to do perturbations into any order you want is to be able to evaluate traces of spin operators so with the free Hamiltonian. Just trace. So this, of course, we know what this is. This is just delta A B over three uh, S into S plus one. So when you get three or four of them. Uh, things that become a little more complicated, but not too bad. You can evaluate all the traces. So basically, once you know the traces, and once you know how to do Wick's theorem, you're done. You get an exact expansion to any order you want of JK. All right. So, okay. So it's not as scary as it looks. Um, it's really doable, even though there's no Wick's theorem. Um, and in fact, there's a nice way to represent this. Since there's nothing much happening uh, on the spin sector, except the ordering. So you just imagine that you have, uh, here's our time running this way. And the spins are sitting here. So there's a spin and here's a spin. And every time the spin acts, there's a JK and there'll be a spin operator on those points. Um, and then you have, the electrons moving around. Uh, and so you'll get various graphs like this. 
So these are the electrons. You get a graph like this for some boundary interaction term. Um, and then you will also get this graph. Uh, so this one with the opposite order. Uh, sorry. Okay, things like this. And you know, and then and this graph is not exactly the same as this for various reasons, including the fact that the spin ordering is different. The, the spin comes before that. Uh, as far as the uh, the spin up uh, matrix elements of the conduction electron is concerned, if this is your real time, and then the spins of the conduction electron operators come in the opposite order. So the fact that the spins don't commute, that the SU2 algebra is extremely important. Uh, it's, it's, it's only the non commutativity of different spin components that leads to something non trivial. Okay, so that's a sketch of the calculation, the actual calculation in the notes. You can see it. Uh, and you can just see right here, what we are computing is the, the, the zeroth order term with just one spin uh, with the conduction electron coming in like this. So this is JK. And these are the two contributions that order JK squared uh, to the renormalization of JK. Okay. So if you compute this, which is done in the notes, and you get the famous and in top, now you get the following result, uh, which is what Kondo did is set finite temperature. In a more complicated calculation, we can be directly computed the resistivity. Here we're just thinking of the renormalization of JK. That's the bare term. These are the renormalization terms. Um, and so what you get is that something like this, uh, JK renormalized uh, is JK, uh, just the bare JK uh, plus JK squared. Um, and then you get uh, okay, integral over the density of states of the conduction electrons, rho of E uh, over basically mod E uh, with a factor of two. This is at zero temperature. Okay. So here. Yeah, so what is uh, rho of E? Uh, rho of E is one over volume, sum on K, uh, delta of E, that's EK. So that's the EK is the dispersion relation of the conduction electron. Okay, so this is what you get from uh, second order uh, in the condo coupling. All right, so this, uh, the only trouble with this integral is it's divergent. Uh, there's a log divergent because rho of E, we're just going to replace rho of E by a constant, which, what I call it in the notes, sorry, in the notes I call it D of E. So let's stick to that. So we just replace D of E by D of zero um, because typically the condo, all of the interesting physics is happening at edge scale much below the Fermi energy. Uh, the condo couplings are much smaller than the Fermi energy and so on. All right, so this is divert. There's of course an upper cutoff of some type. Uh, and there's a, in the physical system, there'll be some cutoff, for example, temperature. Um, if you try to do this like finite temperature, uh, so you get a finite answer, which is what condo finds. So what you find then roughly speaking, uh, that JK normalized is JK there. The k times one plus, you know, I mean the, the, the coefficient is precisely determined. And I hope I got it right here. I think it's fine. So there's two contributions here from, sorry, I should really make this, I'll get rid of the two now. Uh, this is only for positive energies. Uh, so one plus jk 
log of cutoff over temperature. Uh, and there's a D of zero here. Okay, so Condor computed something else, uh, but this is what he found, that there was some bare quantity and then the correction was one press JK times the density of states and log of some cutoff over temperature. Okay, so what, what does this tell us? Minus plus because it's second order perturbation theory. Is that, is well, that important? coupling is increasing. So yeah. as you're going to low temperatures, uh, the RG flows to large. The reason that happens in this calculation is because it's second order perturbation theory. No, I don't think so. The fact that this is plus? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I think that relies on the spin commutation relations. I see. Uh, it comes from commutator of spins. Uh, yeah, well, for example, I mean, here JK is positive, meaning your yeah, interactions are anti ferromagnetic. If JK was, JK can be negative. Right. Uh, then the flow is in the opposite direction. So if you have a ferromagnetic coupling, uh, then the Coupling goes to zero, and that's why there is no condo effect there. Okay, so what we notice here is that the correction becomes of order the zeroth order term. So this cannot be trusted. You know, this is the physicist's way of deciding when a theory is not convergent. Just look at the first term and see when it becomes of order the zeroth order term. Uh, so this cannot be trusted for T uh, less than some condo temperature, where the condo temperature uh, roughly is of order J times exponential minus one over uh, D of zero and J. For, I'm assuming J is positive, right? J, K. Lambda in the first term? Um, yeah, okay. Lambda. We don't know what lambda is. Uh, of course, there are. You need to go to two loops and next order to uh, get the prefactor correct. Uh, the complicated stuff there too. Uh, and this has been done to very high order. <laughs> but at one loop order, we can't really say anything about the prefactor. Uh, but we can say that this exponent. This is in fact exact. The term in the exponent is exactly this number. Um, okay, so we're getting some. Divergence in our perturbation theory because of very low temperature effects. Uh, and uh, so, what Kondo said was, uh, aha, this explains the minimum. So, what Kondo could say there, well, things are increasing, so maybe there's a minimum. And this is the Kondo temperature, and this is a resistivity. But what Kondo couldn't say is, what happens now? What happens at very. Well, because this is a term that's becoming larger, uh, uh, it's become so the resistivity of all the other terms of resistivity decreases the lower the temperature. Here you're getting a term of the resistivity that increases the lower the temperature. But you so have two terms. It pushes it up. It might be pushing it down. No, no pushing it. Okay. Yeah, it shows it pushes it up. Yeah. If they may not be a minimum, it's true. It could be. <laughs> yeah, but only okay, okay. So. Got to improve it as a minimum, but it's a possible explanation for a minimum. <laughs> and beyond that, he couldn't say. I mean, in fact, this thing just blows up as t goes to infinity. Maybe the resistance goes to infinity. In fact, it doesn't. This term goes to infinity as t goes to zero, which would suggest the resistance would be infinite. It becomes an insulator. It does, and it saturates. Uh, and that requires more sophisticated analysis than Pondo was able to do. Okay. How it saturated wasn't understood much later um, in you know, Wilson's numerical RG and also in Natan Andre's Bedianta solution and so on. Uh, that was required to then understand uh, the really low temperature behavior. Uh, so, as I said, uh, this has an alternative interpretation in RG where you imagine taking the cutoff and reducing the cutoff. Uh, so you go from lambda to lambda minus two lambda. Uh, and then you say that um, use this notation that 
uh, lambda minus d lambda, lambda times e to the minus dl, uh, and then you can different. You can write this as a differential equation d k k dl uh, with rule of zero times uh, d of zero. Sorry, times j k square. Yeah, and then all of our ignorance is in the higher order terms, uh, d q, many of which are known today, of course. Okay, uh, so this is a, a, you know, the world's simplest RG, but also one of the most important. Uh, so as you go to low energies, there's a flow to a very strong couplet. So this is telling us that as you lower the temperature, go to low energy scale, things fall apart. <laughs> and JK, you know, all kinds of things could happen here. We don't know. There could be a critical point, another fixed point. That's what happened in the multi-channel condo case or go all the way to infinity. Uh, and what is the behavior of the system at, when JK is all at infinity? Well, we can discuss that in a minute. Uh, okay, so is that clear? Uh, is the, the perturbation series in this case has a finite radius of convergence, no? Radius, I don't think so. Uh, you mean here? I mean, just like QCD, yeah, I don't think it does. No, it doesn't. It's yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that was going to be my next remark. This is uh, exactly the RG equation for lambda QCD uh, for, for the gauge coupling of in QCD. Uh, of course, in the field theory literature is written uh, in the opposite way. They say that at, uh, when you go to very high energies, things become free and the gauge coupling becomes zero. Uh, so, that's asymptotic freedom. Uh, and at very low energies, you have confinement. So this is the asymptotically free fixed point, and who knows what happens on the other side. So to so you really have to figure out figure out what happens at large JK. And I would say Wilson in his numerical renomination group was the first one to figure that out. And later on, there were more exact methods used. Uh, and what essentially what Wilson showed. Uh, was that it goes in fact to infinity all the way. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and so now we can, you know, what is the behavior of the condo Hamiltonian at JK equals infinity? So you can go back to the Hamiltonian and see actually uh, it's not so bad. You can figure out what happens here uh, just by a new strong coupling analysis. Okay. Uh, but this analysis by itself doesn't tell us that this is this is the simple flow all the way to infinity. So you have a new fixed point here, and we have to do an analysis near this fixed point. Okay, so let's go back to our condo Hamiltonian. Um, yeah, so Okay, question. Yeah. So if you, all your goal is to understand this Hamiltonian, then I understand the logic of mm -hmm. such as all of you close. Yeah. But you started from another Hamiltonian, which had W. Yeah. It was yeah. a truncation to get to this one. Yeah. Right. Now, what is not clear is whether the, in, in that truncation, JK was, was small. Correct, so correct. Is it valid to take JK to infinity in this Hamiltonian? Rather than considering the original problem, um, I think it is. Yeah, not the same problem. It is not the same problem, right? Uh, so JK, you may remember, uh, was 
uh, w squared over u. So if jk is going to infinity, that's sort of like u going to zero. <laughs> and u going to zero, we understand. This is free fermions. Uh, and in fact, now that's exactly the conclusion we'll come to by looking at this animal talk in that apart from some potential scattering, it looks like this is just free fermion scattering of some potential impurity. So why didn't you do that from the start? Well, because uh, uh, I can't justify that at large u. I mean, remember the JK equal to infinity, that's in some rescaled energy units. You know, you risk every time you do the RD, you're rescaling your units. So it's infinity, but it's really infinity with respect to the new cutoff. You have the reduced cutoff, lambda has come down to some very small value, and now JK is about the cutoff. So the original mapping was done when the cutoff was much larger. So it's a different problem at this point. <laughs> So this has been strongly renormalized as a cutoff here, which I'm not writing down. But so it's not immediately obvious that JK goes to infinity is the same as U goes to zero. We have to analyze this separately. Okay. So, but that is in fact the answer. So, and it's easy to see why. Um, all right. So now, now we really want to look at it in two dimensions because the one-dimensional case will be different. Uh, in the JK was to bit. Uh, so let's say if there's our origin, this is our origin site here. So what uh, what are we going to do when JK is infinity? Well, this D spin will just take one electron from the Fermi C and form a single with it. Okay. So on this side, say that's the origin site, uh, I'll get a state, which will be uh, one over square root of two, uh, you know, C dagger zero up. D dagger zero down, like C dagger zero down, like D dagger zero on one side. Uh, okay. So I'm going to get, uh, you can't see the red very clearly, but anyway, so that's a spin singlet between the, uh, between the C electron uh, and C, C zero electron and the D electron. And that's singlet's going to sit there. Um, okay, so there's an infinite Fermi C, so you peel off one electron. Now, if you had a finite size system, I have to worry about that. If one electron disappeared, it's going to change my uh, boundary conditions and so on. <laughs> but let's not worry about it for now. Uh, if you want, you know, the conformal field theory, that's the crucial effect, in fact. And you write down the theory of the function. Right? Uh, so you peel off one electron, and now, this thing is a spin singlet, uh, and the, there are some excited states here. There's a triplet state, which will be excited by, uh, uh, by some of these terms. You remove an electron or something. But the moment you excite it, you're going to pay an energy JK. So you don't want to excite it. It's just, it's just a, a vegetable sitting there. Okay. And so for the rest of the electron is concerned, uh, this is exactly like adding a forbidding electron from going there. So I can replace this term uh, by the term from D, C dagger zero alpha, Z, C zero alpha, S and V to infinity. I'll just have a hole <laughs> in my lattice. It's just a potential term. The spin has formed a singlet. And if I want to break the singlet, I have to pay a large energy. So I don't want to pay that. Uh, I still have a lot of gapless excitations. They will scatter off this impurity uh, but that's all. And that I can do. You know, I can solve the problem of this free electron scattering of, a, of an empty site. Yeah, that's going to be exactly solved. In fact, we'll get to it in a minute. Uh, and so our conclusion is that in the end, the, it's, there's no spin left, and it's just a slightly normalized Fermi liquid uh, with, a free, with a missing site. Okay. So uh, that allows us to conclude, for example. I'm still behind. Yeah. The index K on the C in the first on the first term is a momentum index. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. And the index zero is a side uh, index. Is a side index. Yeah, if you feel better, let me just so it's it. not just this is just one of the Ks. Yeah, I should have uh, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Um, there's also, you know, when you go from k's to zeros, there's factors of one over square of volume that you could keep track of. But 
Yeah, they, they all this, fall out. Yeah. This, this analysis doesn't enable you to calculate the the uh, limiting resistance at t equals zero. Oh, uh, it does. It I mean, up to a constant, it will allow you to. It's, uh, it's finite, but I there's some something. Yes. So there is a sophisticated. There's a precise way to do this, okay. uh, which is uh, which is done by Nozier, uh, where you look at now you look at. Well, this will give you some zero temperature, some finite constant resistivity. So, right. so from from now you uh, you know, for example, about the resistivity. So Condor told us it started to go up. This analysis told us it goes to a constant. So the, this impurity only gives you some constant. Right. And now you want to connect them up, and you can uh, you can do high order perturbations here that will allow you to go to a bit better here. But you can also start doing this here. Uh, and that requires you to put in other leading irrelevant operators. This is the first, this is a relevant operator, but there are other operators that you can write down. Uh, so that was done by Nozier, I won't do it. Uh, and then putting new operators here at the strong coupling fixed point, you can figure out uh, the temperature dependence of it. Right. But of course that each operator comes with a new unknown coefficient. Uh, then to get the whole function, uh, in the limit where the bare JK is small, you need two more. You need to solve the full problem. <laughs> and that's what Najan Andre did, uh, where you can get the full function, including the coefficients of all the leading operators, the relevant operators, uh, all expressed in terms of one unknown, which is TK. I think in QCG, you do very similar things, right? That's heavy quark perturbation theory or something like that. <laughs> No, not quite, but some this, there are very strong coupling expansions in QCD. <laughs> need the Nathan Andre, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> we need, yeah. we need <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, right. <laughs> I believe it's not into the <laughs> Yeah, it's chaotic. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so I think I've covered the basic phenomenology and, and, uh, the basic RG equation uh, without actually doing any serious calculation. Uh, any questions? <laughs> I mean, the, the condo calculation is fun to do. Uh, it's in my notes. Uh, you, you can do it in many different ways. Uh, and uh, yeah, everyone should do it once. Yes. Well, actually, I have one question. If you went back to the Anderson model. Yes. Since, uh, you could guess in view of this answer that we could get the same thing in the Anderson model by setting u and v to zero. And then instead of being adding an electron vacancy, we'd have an extra electron. Yes. And we have to solve that. But I suspect it flows in the infrared to the same thing as if you had a vacancy. Yeah, so basically this says that small u perturbations in the Anderson model is stable, which, which it is. So you could do small u perturbation theory. Uh, and this uh, effectively you know, small u perturbation theory is like a large JK series, whereas this ultimately is a small, you know, this whole RG flow is only believable and it's only universal when JK, the bare JK is small, because then uh, it's only the RG flow right here that's universal. You know, once it gets strong coupling, uh, if you start with a large bare JK, there could be other relevant operators you do have to worry about. Uh, so there's a, I think, yeah, there's, there's a matching of the terms, uh, order by order in one over JK and small u, but I don't think there's any quantitative connection. Yeah, but I think that's, uh, I think with putting u equal to zero in the Anderson model would be similar to going to that QCD at strong coupling. And it gives you qualitative. Yeah, it gives qualitative, yeah. That's Yeah, so these questions actually become much more relevant and interesting uh, when you talk about the, the lattice, condo lattice model, which probably I won't do today. Uh, yeah, in fact, I won't. Uh, and there also, it you know, took a while to understand that the condo lattice model. So when you take the condo lattice model, you know, the small u perturbation theory is, has a lot of nice features. You can prove things like Lattinger's theorem. To all orders in you, you can do all kinds of things for the lattice, uh, from the lattice, for the, yeah, 
Okay, in, in the small band is a lattice model. You can prove all kinds of things to all orders in U. Uh, and to see how that emerges from the quantum model is highly non trivial, uh, which was in particular. Uh, so, this is going to be a major topic of various future lectures. So, if you took the small U perturbation theory of the Anderson lattice model, it would tell you that the volume of the Fermi surface includes the, number, the density of B electrons. Whereas, if you start from the condo lattice model, that's highly non obvious because the D electrons don't even move. Uh, should that have a large Fermi surface or should it have a small Fermi surface? And the answer is actually both are possible. So in the lattice model, there's another phase possible with a small Fermi surface uh, where the small U picture doesn't work, but there's another phase where the small U picture does work. <laughs> uh, but this problem is kind of simple. The small U picture always works. Uh, and uh, because JK always flows to infinity. I mean, for the multi-channel quantum problem, for example, you could never use a small new picture because you flow to a fixed point. That's a finite JK. <clears throat> okay. All right. So uh, what I want to do now is actually do a calculation, uh, which is very much in the spirit of the calculation we did for spin liquids. Uh, it's a kind of a large M calculation, which has the virtue of reproducing all this phenomenology almost exactly the correct. Uh, so all the way at all temperatures. So in a one over n expansion, you can compute the whole thing uh, and hope that it applies for n equals two. In fact, in this case, it does pretty well. But it has a secondary advantage, which is the real reason for doing it, uh, which is that it generalizes to the lattice problem. But you have infinite number of impurities, not just one. So let me talk about that now. All right, so we're going to look at the same Hamiltonian uh, and we're going to turn the crank by all the fancy methods you've learned in studying spin liquids. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce uh, spin-ons and I'm going to call them F rather than D now because just to emphasize that these are uh, uh, not electrons. And um, and there's a constraint, F dagger alpha, alpha uh, goes this one. Okay. So now you see immediately there's a U1 gauge symmetry. This is F alpha goes to F alpha into the F phi of tau. There's only time, there's no space uh, in this gauge symmetry. Well, this is kind of a trivial gauge symmetry uh, because there's only time, so there's no flux, uh, and you can always choose a gauge where you can get rid of it. Uh, although there's some subtleties with periodic boundary conditions uh, at finite temperature, you can't quite get rid of it. Um, okay. Um, anyway, so, so we kind of try to use the gauge language now. Uh, which is uh, using a sledgehammer to crack a nut, but it's because the same language will be much more powerful later on for more complicated problems. So, so we want to ask now, you have a U1 gauge symmetry and what is its fate in the low temperature limit of this Hamiltonian? Sorry to interrupt, but the Fs are the same as the Ds in the Anderson model. Uh, the Ds in the Anderson model didn't have a constraint. So, oh, okay. yes. They didn't have a constraint, but... Yeah, so I, I yeah, so I, just for future purposes and to clear to really emphasize that these are not electrons, I'm calling it S. But I should have called them D, but I'm, yeah, I'm changing notation. Yes, <laughs> that's all. So they are on the community. They're still on the community. Oh, yeah, that, yes, 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 yeah. But there's only one side, so. <laughs> uh, they certainly anti commute to the C's and so on. Okay. Okay, so where we're going with this is we're going to find, in fact, even a closer analogy to, to QCD, uh, we're going to find that the strong coupling state, uh, in this case, is a Higgs phase, where this gate symmetry is Higgs, so it's like a confining phase. Uh, 
And it's that confinement, which is the essence of the condo effect, where the spin is extreme by the production of the electron. They're kind of confined to each other. The spin on becomes an electron by a Higgs phenomenon. All right, those are just words for now, and you can just discard them if you don't like them, but they'll become useful when we talk about the condo lattice model. Uh, all right, but let's just go forge ahead. So we, the first thing we're going to do to do the large end expansion, uh, you can write this, rewrite this term uh, as, as we've done before. Yeah, so this term is uh, minus JK over two. Uh, F dagger alpha, C zero alpha, and C dagger zero beta, F beta, uh, plus some constants, more important for us, uh, where alpha and beta go from, uh, from one to two. But now I'm going to go from one to M, I'm going to replace this two by M. And M is going to become large, and this is going to become M over two. Okay. Uh, and that's all you really need to do. So now we can take the exact partition function, uh, which is an integral over C, integral over F alpha, uh, of exponential minus the usual term, but let's just focus on the important term here, the plus. Uh, zero to beta, dk over m, and let me write this as f dagger alpha, c zero alpha mod squared. And then I do my favorite trick of a Hubbard Stranovitz transformation. So I add another field of dp, uh, which is just a function of i, and that will be m mod p squared over jk. Minus p times f zero alpha c dagger zero alpha and it's p star and f. Sorry, <laughs> this is all awful notation. F alpha dagger c zero alpha c zero alpha dagger f alpha. So all so far exact and very much paralleling the spin liquid. In fact, this is a much simpler case of the spin liquid. And in some sense, I should have done this before we went to spin liquids. But then we wouldn't have, you know, the advantage of spin liquids, we don't have this gapless C to worry about, which is the C electrons. Uh, and now you can see that if I do the path integral over these two, I'm left, uh, I get some action uh, which has an M out front. Okay, so. After there's also a Lagrange multiplier, so I get the Z that uh, is some pattern goal of a DP and a Lagrange multiplier B lambda of exponential minus m times some uh, effective action, which is a functional of p and lambda. Here I have another term here, which is i lambda times f dagger alpha f alpha minus m over two. Okay, all the details are in the notes. All right, so then you, play the usual game uh, and you look for the saddle point equations. What happened to the first term in H? I didn't write it out, it's there. There are various oh, okay. and, and when you integrate it out the Cs. You yeah, there you certainly need uh, all of that information to, to know what S effect it is. But I'm going to, I'm not writing out explicitly because we can guess what we really care about are the saddle point equations. Uh, P 
equals zero. So what are these equations? What form do they take? And I claim you can just guess if you have enough experience with this, hopefully. You can simply guess what form these will take. Both lambda and P will have a time-independent expectation time. So the mean field equations that you get are the large and mean field equations. So you have some mean field Hamiltonian, which will of course have the first term. And then it will have uh, the mean value of lambda, lambda bar times uh, F dagger alpha, also, well, yeah, okay, uh, minus m over two. And p will also be replaced by a mean value minus p bar of uh, c dagger zero alpha of alpha percentage of quantity. So beautifully, I just got a free fermion Hamiltonian. Uh, with at u equals zero. <laughs> uh, so there's no interaction. There's just some chemical potential for the F and there's a hybridization P bar. So the difference from the original model, which I, if I just put u equals zero in the original model, uh, this will be some bare chemical potential. Uh, this would be W, but now this is not W. It's something non-trivial. It has to be determined by solving these equations. And so you have a self consistent equation like in any Hartree-Fock theory. You have the equation that uh, for the trivial one F dagger alpha, F alpha expectation value is M over two. But you also have the equation that P bar uh, is one over M times the expectation value of F dagger alpha C zero alpha. Okay. So that's a very standard large end procedure. And you're back to the u equals zero Hamiltonian, uh, the Anderson Hamiltonian, except that the hybridization, as it's called, has to be determined self consistently. Okay. And that's, in fact, of the, all of the physics of the Pondo effect is in that self consistency. That's where we find the logs and everything else. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, all right. So now we have to solve these equations that in fact, most of them can be solved. And I'll talk about that next time. Uh, let me just make one comment now. What about this gauge symmetry? So now, if I look at these new fields that I introduced, uh, you can see that P, uh, well, it's a scalar, so it's like a boson. Uh, and P also transforms under the gauge symmetry. Here I may have the convention graph. So P has the same transformation uh, as F dagger. So P goes to two times e to the minus i phi of tau. Okay. So what's happened here is that in the saddle point, if there's such a saddle point that P bar is non-zero, uh, then at that saddle point, I have the condensation of a scalar field, which is a charge in the gate symmetry. So that's like the Higgs mechanism. So any non-zero value of P bar is telling you that you're in the Higgs phase, and then you can forget about the gate symmetry, which is why people never talk about it. And the essence of the condo effect is simply the statement uh, that no matter how small uh, JK, JK goes to zero, P bar is always non-zero. Uh, so there's all, you're always in the Higgs phase. That's the same statement as JK flows to infinity. P is a quantum mechanical degree of freedom that lives at the point, right? Yes, this is the saddle point. Yeah, there'll be fluctuations about it. Right, so then the gauge symmetry shouldn't should be average over the, the phase of P? Yeah, you could, well, or you can fix the gauge by, uh, you can make lambda time, oh, it's often easier is to make lambda time independent, and that fixes the gauge completely. A lambda is also transformed the gauge symmetry as, a, as the vector field. So lambda 
uh, goes to lambda minus d phi d tau or something like that. I mean, uh, I, so I, you I, have I, to I, fix the gauge in some way. Okay, maybe what confuses me is, is the fact that we have like, like a zero dimensional problem with some Gauss flow. Yeah. Normally we would impose that, that would impose that we have just single. Uh, um, yeah, well, uh, I'm not sure how to answer that. Uh, basically, uh, <clears throat> I mean, there is a Gauss law, but this is the statement of Gauss's law that the density is fixed, okay? Uh, and you're not allowed to fluctuate. There's no charge fluctuation. This is, like, this is basically Gauss's law here. This is the gate charge is M over two. No, no fluctuations. Uh, and that Gauss law is imposed by the lambda fluctuations. Uh, but there's a gate symmetry in the sense that if you try to do the path integral literally, you'll find very zero mode because of this symmetry. So you have to fix the gauge. And you can fix the gauge to make lambda time independent. Uh, and then the phase of P becomes physical and it's involved in the one over n correction of various quantities. Uh, and it represents those, the fluctuation represents some of these other uh, nosy effect I was talking about, various density density interactions are spent high order corrections to the fixed point, but it won't change the fixed point. I think what Juan is asking about is that since you're in zero dimensions, yeah, zero plus one dimension, there isn't really a meaningful Higgs versus non Higgs. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I think there's no Coulomb phase in zero dimensions. <laughs> right. So uh, like I said, yes, I agree with that. Sure, I mean, uh, this language, you can discard it if you don't like it. It's just a very useful language once you get to the lattice. Maybe model. it's precise for larger, actually. It is precise for larger, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, why is it precise for larger? Because large is like income value is free. So I'm just guessing. But they all, transform, they all transform under the same phase. There's only one new one that acts only on one side. I mean, you can imagine a phase where P bar is zero, and even in this model, but that's a very ugly phase because in that phase, the JK has gone to zero and you have a degenerate two level system coupled to something else. Yeah. So that's kind of a very trivial state with a degeneracy. Uh, so that never happens here. Uh, you can also get some more non-trivial fixed points, I guess, uh, but not in this particular large M limit. There are more SYK large limits you can take in some multi-channel problems. I think I can say, I think I can say okay. yeah. the procedure is to pick a temporal gauge, which in this case is lambda equals constant. Yes. And then you impose Gauss law. Yeah. And then, the, or, or equivalently, when you fix that gauge, the, there's a remaining freedom, which is time independent gauge. Right. right. So, so that's but an in this case, But in this case, there are no time independent gauge transformations. No, no, if you're if you're a finite temperature and you integrate you, know, you do have to integrate over the time independent gauge transformations. Uh, and that will get you to the canonical versus non-canonical ensemble. And in fact, my only paper with uh, Alexi Kitev, we do that in great detail for the SY complex SYK model where there's similar ratios. You do have to do this time integral of this thing for the thermal circle, and that gives you answers either in the canonical, this is like a canonical ensemble. Or the grand canonical ensemble where you fix lambda and not, not the density. But all of that you know, gives you higher order corrections we don't care about really. But fair point, yeah. I mean, this is really perhaps, I mean, the large end procedure and everything I've written down, all the words are perfectly valid. Uh, the words I attach to them, you can discard them if you don't like that. But I find them useful once you get to the lattice model. <laughs> Okay, thanks. <laughs>